So I'm Tom, yeah, this is the, the fourth communication session. Um, we've got three talks. The first is by Keegan, um, here, which is uh, about a, a day in the life, um, or a, a day in the mail room. The, the next uh, talk is, uh, you'll be meeting the press team um, for, for the foundation. And the third talk uh, will be the role of the funds distribution committee, or funds dissemination. <laughs> But distribution is a nicer word. Um, so, over to Keegan. Thank you. Just as a quick check, um, can you raise your hand if you are or have been an OTRS agent for Wikimedia? Just so I know what's going on. Okay, a little less than half, that's pretty good. Um, all right, so um, welcome to OTRS. OTRS stands for the Open Source Ticket Response System or Request System. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, you can read the Wikipedia article. Um, uh, formerly, we are known as the Volunteer Response Team, but everyone pretty much knows this is OTRS, so we'll stick with that. My name is Keegan Peterzell. Uh, my first name is Keegan, that is my name. I've been an OTRS agent since March of 2009, and an OTRS, one of the eight OTRS administrators since July of 2000, uh, 2010. There's an etherpad here. If you just want to jot down questions or anything, that's fine. If there's time at the end, we can get to that or thoughts or anything you might have um, that might be useful for later. We can go with that. Um, so we'll, if you have questions, do hold them at the end. If there's time, we'll get to it. And if not, we'll talk about it later. Um, first off, can anyone take a guess of what, what is the most popular email that we receive to the Wikimedia Foundation? Anybody want to throw out an idea? Close. Your website is broken, I can edit it. That's close. <laughs> but, um, no, no, it's like anyone else, it's spam. It's a whole lot of spam. So with the OTRS software, we have a spam assassin filter that does a good job in, in filtering out. OTRS itself does have an, a postmaster filter that allows us administrators to set up uh, regex filters to get rid of problematic emails. For the most part, though, we don't do that um, for practical reasons. Email addresses that people may use to spam, you know, a million people around the world to buy whatever their product is, they might actually use that same address to contact Wikipedia with a question, a comment, or a concern. It happens. It happens uh, fairly regularly. So almost every piece of spam that goes through OTRS is viewed by a person, for the most part. Um, the second is uh, fairly common, happens about once a week, and it was guessed earlier, and it's my favorite email that we get after 13 years. Our website's buggy 
because I changed it. Uh, people are going to learn through interactive social media websites you can interact with the internet. It's relatively new compared to the age of the internet, but people don't, still don't understand that with things like Wikipedia and things that they view as resources for consuming information, that they can interact with it as well. We get a lot of email about perennial disputes, and these are pretty much the same thing that we have on Wiki. Um, and these, um, so for some background, what we're receiving in emails are people who don't have the time, the care, or know how to register account, edit on Wikipedia, find their way for answers. And so what we're doing as volunteers are answering emails. We receive about a 5,000 a week. Um, that's just for the information queue for the English Wikipedia alone, or English languages alone. And for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be speaking in generalities about information for the English queues. We do have 29 other language queues to consider, um, but we're just talking about English. So what we do on OTRS when we receive emails is our job is to provide communications and information. Our overall job is not to act on agents of people's behalfs or advocates. We are there to, um, to, to let them know how they can get involved or just find the answers that they want because wikis are big places. And it's very difficult to find perennial disputes list and have to do with things like the Sea of Japan versus the East Sea or Danzig versus Gdansk. That's an edit war that we had on Wikipedia a decade ago. And we still get emails wondering why the article is not called Danzig. <laughs> Maps of India, always a popular one. The question is whether or not should the map show Kashmir, which is disputed to some as an Indian state. Our map show Kashmir because that's what we've discussed and decided through our consensus and process that that's what it's going to be. And the same goes for a map of Serbia, whether or not Kosovo is a part of Serbia. These are just a few examples, but there are many more debates that we also get emails about from people who are just reading Wikipedia and wondering why we present things this way. So what our job is as OTRS agents, it's to provide the information of, first off, what is Wikipedia? How are we writing things? We are writing things for a neutral point of view. We require reliable sources for what people write. And we discuss things and that things are provided for consensus. These are the fundamental principles that we involve when we answer people's emails, linking people to that so they can find out why things look that they are even if they disagree. And also explain to them that this is the consensus driven process, that there's not a, pol that overall it's not a political agenda on the part of the English Wikipedia to call it Sea of Japan and to slight Koreans. It's that through discussion and the sources available, that's what the community has decided that we are going to call it for now. And it's only for now because Wikipedia is not finished and article names change. Um, one of these days, Ivory Coast might be Cote d'Ivoire in the English Wikipedia. You never know, it's been 13 years, it might never change. But it still could, even though we've debated it over and over and over and over, we can still debate it again. And we can change our minds sometimes. We get a lot of your website offended me. An example, depictions of Muhammad, um, that, that will be naturally be offensive and people want to let us know. And often with things like things that are offensive and things that people don't believe is right and should be shown, like Muhammad or the Sea of Japan or Indian maps or Serbia, you get from somewhere on the internet email campaigns to come out. People send us mass email or send us emails in droves and they come in waves for a lot of these topics as they take communities interest like non-Wikimedia communities, just other online communities interest and they send us emails about it. And so we have boilerplates which are like templates that we use to respond to a lot of these mass emails but once you become experienced as an agent, kind of like using templates as a Wikimedian, you can eventually learn how to personalize your response and you don't have to use the boilerplate every time. But you, the message is still clear. We're providing links to the information of what you're trying to find. So you get, people are offended by search results. Uh, you go to Commons and you look up something and you're not expecting to see the picture that showed up. Um, but you know, we can work on our search. Things can improve it. But overall, that doesn't matter if they are offended by the search. Well, that does matter. What matters is we're providing them why does that content exist and that it's to be used in an educational purpose. It is not there to offend. Explicit media, um, such as uh, movies from uh, the Holocaust, um, has recently caused some controversy. Um, that is not there to upset someone or jar them. It is there to provide educational context for what they're reading in articles. And we need to explain that to people, and we do so that they understand that, again, the, the whole mission that we're doing is to provide education for free. And there's personal reasons that people may have. Um, someone might write in and have an issue with our article on child abuse and how um, it may, not, may or may not 
advocate enough for the prevention of child abuse or any sort of controversial subject. Uh, subject. It just doesn't do enough to correct the problem that is in the world. And we'll get to that in a minute. We get a lot of questions about reuse, which is really nice because it's actually people taking the time to um, make sure that they're correctly taking things from Wikipedia and reusing it on the internet and not doing what most people on the internet do and just steal. Um, so that includes images, it includes text, and we just let them know about the Creative Commons license and the GFDL and whatever is available for them and that they can reuse it. And we thank them. And people let us know multiple ways that they're using it. Presentations like this for a conference. Um, I've learned over the years that there are an extraordinary number of people developing their own board games at home that use images and text from Wikimedia. Um, so they're more than happy to support them. And Radius includes the wiki name alone. Uh, and we can provide them the link to the wiki article. They can read and learn about it and know that they don't have to have our permission to use the word wiki nor award Cunningham's. It's just the word and it's the software. And Wikimedia owned logos and marks. That is not something we handle. That goes to the Wikimedia legal team. And so you, they, we tell them, email trademarks, or we'll forward the email on their behalf ourselves and let them know that we are forwarding their email because we want to make sure that they're going through the appropriate legal channels to have marks reused. And we also thank them for contacting us before just taking the mark and trying to reuse it. We have to tell a lot of people about what Wikipedia and Wikimedia is not. We're not a phone book. I don't have a way to get in touch with Eric Clapton just because he has an article on the English Wikipedia. <laughs> Yes, happens all the time. We're not WikiLeaks. Uh, you'd think after all this time, people would know that, but they're, they're not. Um, it, and it's a common confusion to have. And then you explain, though, the principles of a wiki. This is what we are. This is way over here. Like, the two may not necessarily be mutually exclusive in some ways of the idea of opening up information, but we're not WikiLeaks. So please don't stop donating because you think we are. Um, and we are not other wikis. We are not WikiHow. Um, we get a lot of emails that people are actually intending to send a wiki how, thinking that they're a part of our project. And normally we, we inform them, provide them with appropriate contact information. And Wikimedia is not generally an advocate. Um, so we are not there while we understand and have sympathy if uh, something has personally offended you, something like child abuse, and you feel that the foundation, sh or that Wikimedia should be advocating for it, or the foundation, or anything like that. Generally, we're not advocates. Um, of course, there's exceptions. There's things like the SOPA blackout. Um, but that wasn't necessarily about political advocacy. That was about the security of knowledge and when knowledge was brought into politics. And that wasn't our choice. We get a lot of out-of-scope requests that we can't handle. I can't delete your account. That's just not going to be possible. We can't unblock you through OTRS. We're not going to delete or undelete a page for you. We're not, you can't revoke the license that you've submitted to. And again, our purpose is to point people to where they can go and request these things. And often people will write back in the correspondence. And I tried that route. They didn't listen to me. You do it for me. And you have to in which case you just point them to the policies and you let them know you're writing to an email you're asking for information i provided it to you and i hope that you can find a reasonable resolution mm -hmm. sometimes they get mad sometimes they understand sometimes they don't hear back but that's out of our hands we provided the information and we put it out there um, same goes for unblocking accounts well transparency actually all of this really has to do with transparency except for revoking your license um, if you want your account deleted you need to go over to the bureaucrat's notice board and file a rename, and that's about the closest that we can do. We have to just point you to where to go. Same would go for unblock, deleting, or undeleting a page. The revocation of a license, that's really not an option, and that actually happens a lot when you explain that it can't delete your account, both for the on-wiki process, as well as the licensing that you agreed to when you made your account and when you made your contribution, when you make every contribution, which where revoke license comes to then, okay, well then I take that all back. Now you can delete my account. No, no, just probably need to get renamed and, and then just pretend this all never happened and we'll put these dark bays behind us. So permissions and photo submission. Uh, this actually is mainly focused on commons, um, but uh, a lot of the English Wikipedians help out with this. Um, it is commons oriented and requires a lot of licensing knowledge. And more importantly, being able to explain the licensing knowledge in non-legalese and then point them to where they can read the legalese if they choose. It's kind of like trying to narrow down the terms of use. Uh, yeah, 
contribute to Wikipedia. Don't be a jerk. Everything you're putting out there is free. Have a nice day. Um, and, and it does things through permissions and photo submission, and these are two separate processes. Uh, permission is there for a photo has already uploaded. So, um, I uploaded an image to Commons. I didn't understand how licensing, filling out the forms worked. I didn't do things appropriately. My image is flagged for deletion or is going to be deleted. Um, or the image may not have the proper licensing or may not, there might be some doubt whether or not it's actually free. In which case people email us and we provide them with a form that they can fill out to make, and we'll, so when we archive it and make sure that everything is properly licensed and the image can be restored, added, and properly tagged. Um, it's one of the only instances though on Wikimedia where you see a regular trust of this file has been granted permission through OTRS. If you're an agent, click on, click on the link you can go guarantee that this is the uh, that this is the agreement for it. Um, it's one of th so through OTRS we can archive that kind of permission. That's about the only thing on OTRS that we will archive and say yes, this is true. It's on OTRS. Uh, pretty much everything else comes from a reliable source. You can't really do this on Wiki um, through emails. There is a lot of personal information that people put in their signature line. Sometimes a stupid extent of information that people put in their signature line of how I can get in touch with them, find them, call them, they're on vacation, here's a different address, whatever. You're emailing some random person. Um, but, you know, we respect that, uh, which is one of the reasons that OTRS does have to remain so much uh, uh, close membership and, and it's pretty rigorous um, to be approved as an agent in reviewing to make sure you can be trusted with this information. So a photo submission allows you to attach the image. You can't figure out how do you upload an image to comments um, using a regular file upload or upload wizard where you tried, you did it wrong, you give up. You just want someone to do it for you. And we can do that, um, provide the appropriate license and we can upload it and we can provide the permissions. This can be a pretty rewarding experience in strange ways. Um, permissions isn't something that I do a lot. Um, I only, only really few in the past. Um, I, I know my license. I'm not that much of a commons person. But occasionally there's fun things that you can help contribute to the internet, like the world's first free headshot of Robert Goulet. Uh, this was provided by his widow, Vero Goulet. She uploaded the file to commons. Um, Naturally, people didn't just trust that a headshot can be free. Um, and it was uh, deleted. Uh, her agent got in touch with OTRS, and we verified that this is through Vera Goulet. Get in touch with Vera. Yes, this image belongs to the estate of Robert Goulet. It doesn't belong to the photographer who took the headshot. It is theirs. And so we upload it. We put it through Commons, properly license it, and it's available with an OTRS link for if other agents need to check the email correspondence that I had with Vera and with her assistant. Um, and, the, and these small things are very valuable things that you can add to the world. Now we're getting into the tricky stuff. Uh, pretty much everything I've said before can be handled through a boilerplate or just a nice well-written message with the proper links and you're not going to hear back. These guys, it's a different story. So, of course, biographies. We, have, we think in terms of biographies of living people. Biographies of dead people matter to their ancestors, families, friends, anyone around who may have known them and want to make sure that the things in the articles and things that we are saying about these people are true, accurate, verifiable. Corporations, enough said. Schools and universities, um, when we get to that, it's kind of interesting how we intera interact with them, uh, both supportive as well as not. And on wiki disputes that, well, no one's listening to me on wiki, I'm going to e email someone and they're going to take care of this for me. Biographies, defamation and libel, people viewing the way they are presented is not fair to them. Um, particularly if they've been involved in things in their life like lawsuits, uh, controversies, um, crimes committed. And what we do through that is, you know, you can read through an article and kind of get an assessment of whether or not it's a neutral. Um, in which case, you know, if, if there is a real issue with that article. It really doesn't read like it follows our standards of having a neutral point of view. It really does seem inappropriate. And we can let them know. And we can leave a note on the article's talk page, not talking about the subject, not that someone emailed us. Just, I was reading this article. It doesn't seem like balanced. Can we work together and figure this out? And then start editing through it yourself and everything. And again, it's not even about that that person contacted us with the trouble. It's the same as if you were reading through an article yourself and you start reading it and you're like, this doesn't feel right. And in that case, that's when you're gonna start working and it's independent of email completely. 
and general inaccuracies with an article. Uh, says that I live in this town. I actually live over here. Well, we need verified reliable sources for that. Um, in, in personal life, I think almost all of us have read biographies in personal life, nothing sourced. These are the children, these are the ch kids' names, this is where they live, here's their street address. Um, so you want to go through the process of checking out and seeing if sources are available and if they can be provided. And even more importantly when it comes to the subject of the biography, talking to them and letting them know, do you really want your Wikipedia article to say where you live? Like, is, do you want to correct that or do you think maybe we can just take that out? Um, so generally people are really receptive to that too because it seems like you're looking out for them. Birth and death days are really important to people. Um, there's many a, a, an email that I've read saying so and so was not born on this day, they were born on this day. I would know, I'm their mom. Uh, and that's true, but again, it's an inaccuracy that needs to be verified and we have to t explain to them about the Wikipedia process and um, how the policies work in making sure that the day, month, or year, often the year, a lot of people would like to be younger than they are, um, is correct. And oftentimes, that information isn't sourced in the article anyway and involves just removing it because it's not sourced and we want to make sure that people have the best representation possible and explaining to them that sometimes it's better to not even have that on wiki particularly if IMDB is ripping off your information from Wikipedia and then you're getting it wrong through there and biographies I want one don't want one uh, you explain to them the article creation process you explain to them that I can't delete your article here's the deletion process to go through that but more importantly making sure that they understand that they know what Wikipedia is how it's being used and what it's there for to be educational to be informative and to provide the world with knowledge about what you are doing and your particular cares and concerns and how and how they can help pretty similar not surprisingly since corporation is a body right defamation libel problems with that um, and again, you read through the article and try to decide how it works. Minor article inaccuracies. We've changed CEOs. That's really easy to do. Um, you know, our stock value has changed. Uh, those, it's not that difficult. But major article inaccuracies, what do you do with that? Again, you, you just have to bring it up with the community if you choose to, or explain to them how Wikipedia works and the eventualism that's supposed to happen. And, and that things will edit out, with, will come out with time. And often these articles are really high trafficked and that um, will be why they're inaccuracies or the complete opposite end. One person wrote it and no one's ever looked at that article, in which case you need to get more eyes on it and we have a BLP notice board, we have uh, other places for corporations to provide that um, and, and get people looking at articles. And again, corporations, why was my article deleted? It's the most frustrating thing to have to explain to people. Your article was not deleted because you're not notable. Well, maybe it was, but we have to explain to them what they see when they see that deletion log and what those acronyms meant and what that maybe kind of maybe snarky deletion summary meant and it wasn't meant to be a, sli a slight to them and, and really it's it's a lot of listening is what a lot of it is when you deal with biographies and corporations you're listening to them and providing an outlet for them to vent because they can't find it on wiki and generally once they've had this outlet um, after some email exchanges you don't hear from them again <laughs> schools and universities Defamation libel, are we seeing a pattern? <laughs> Often with schools and universities, um, they're interested in Wikipedia and its value in educational content. And uh, someone, a system administrator at school will see that their IP for the school has been blocked and um, they want to know who did it. They want to punish, yeah? So the IP's there, you tell them, well, here's the page history, you can go look and find. Well, no, 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 I want to know, here's the account, you need to tell me the IP behind it so I can find it, who did it. And that's when we point the door towards legal process and say, can't help you with that one. Um, sorry, these are just matters that you deal with as a system administrator at school at all time. Um, and generally, I don't believe many follow up with that route because a system administrator is not taking up a lawyer to find a, a person who vandalized an article. But the fun part, though, is when you get partnership requests. Um, people that want to learn how to use Wikimedia in their classrooms and they want to get engaged in it and we point them at the Wikimedia Education Program and the WikiEd Foundation um, and they can go forward from there and learning how to use Wikipedia in their schools. So for the on wiki disputes, I mean the last point is really all there is. There's very little that we can do. Um, often with on wiki disputes we are either the first or the last point of contact. 
uh, because they either don't know how to edit or they figured out they made an edit, they didn't know the policies and they've gotten in trouble and they don't know what's going on or they figured it all out. They still just want an agent to act on their behalf because they feel that they've been slighted. So again, you have a sympathetic ear, point to dispute resolution and that there's not a lot more than that. Everything I've said, people call. They leave voicemails for the foundation back in the day. I remember you could actually call the foundation and a human would answer, um, but obviously we've grown. And so now people call and you deal with them by phone. These are actually, while some of the most challenging requests to deal with, for, people don't expect you're who, you're a volunteer, you have to explain what you're going through. And these actually, the first conversations go on for a while, but it's very humanizing for the point of contact. Wikipedia is not the globe. These these websites, none of the foundation projects are like that. There's humans sitting in this room responsible for everything. People talk to you, they get a better sense. They may still be angry about their situation, but they know that they have been heard. And to wrap this up, there's brief challenges. Uh, there's challenges, new ones all the time. New ones that we have to collaborate as agents to come up with our discussions and our communications because that's what it's all about in writing our boilerplates in training agents and everyone getting on the same page of what's the best way to answer requests. I mean, and those are not all in English. Um, so that's when we collaborate as agents and we document, because obviously there's something going on and we need to get with folks, the appropriate ones, and, and there's cases that we, we are able to handle this ourselves internally as a volunteers, or in case of Selfie Monkey, that's the foundation's involved with that too from the legal team and the communications point. So we, so we get involved with both sides of the foundation and work with agents uh, collaboratively to take care of all that. So, um, I don't think I'm going to have time for questions. Yeah. So. Can I take one from Delphine? We started a bit late, so I think we can um, take a open couple. Up for your questions. I, I thought what was really great was how engaging you were without having any pictures up there, without even having a selfie monkey, because I would have immediately put the monkey up there. Okay. <laughs> I think we've all seen Selfie Monkey. <laughs> and so Selfie questions. Monkey's a lot cuter than me, so you'd just spend the whole time looking over there. <laughs> What about the right to be forgotten? No, I just, just like as a, no. Sure. Uh, yeah, the right. Do, do you have do you have lots? Is or is that just kind of a oh. monkey has over <laughs> has killed the right to be forgotten? Yeah, um, that's a relatively new development to, as well, and one that we haven't had to come up with any sort of strategic game plan over with the right to be forgotten we can pretty much say that well we don't know how this is going to work with Wikipedia yet um, and we're going to see how that one goes so we can wiggle out of that yeah. um, quite a basic question maybe um, where are most images coming from um, Creative Commons images and uh, um, who is initiating most um, provision of images See, that's a fun question because I don't really have an answer for you because uh, it's not static. It's always changing how people are coming across images. Uh, they can find it through search and they may mention that. They may happen to go to an article that they didn't expect to see an illustration that they expected. They might Google something and have the Commons file page show up. So there are many avenues where people can find things that they, that they deem offensive. Um, and I don't really have a 100% answer for that. Okay, any more questions? What? Uh, uh, I, I, I come from Chinese Wikipedia uh... area. Okay, so <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I've encountered uh, one, one of the administrators uh, told me that he, he's really keen to ask a professional photographer to donate his photo and but he's not good in English and he's like to use the OTIS system but it's blocked uh, or it's uh, he didn't he cannot hear the reply and um, um, so there are two questions so the first one is is there a, a like tutorial video that shows the whole OTIS process or is there a like brochure like how to upload photos on wiki comments, that kind of brochures. Is there any materials like that? And second, how does, how's the Chinese OTR system goes? Is there a regular administrator there or we need to owe you reply in English? Two questions. 
Thank you. Sure. Um, so, so for the first question, yeah, permissions and uh, some of the more complicated cases in English take a while. Uh, because like everything else, it's done by volunteers. And when you're a volunteer, you have a sense of how much time you have to work with something and what you can achieve with that time. And therefore, you choose what you're going to do. Particularly with OTRS, we trust our agents to know their time management. We don't want them to get too involved in something that they don't have time for and leave someone left behind. A result of that with Commons needing a lot of photos uploaded and making sure permissions are valid and everything like that is that it takes time. And so there's a regular constant backlog for permissions and for info. Well, I saw info go to zero once. Well, it doesn't even go to zero. It just disappears from your view, in which case, your victory. But it showed up with a new email like a minute later. But I had that screenshot somewhere on my computer. Um, but unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do with that. Uh, making uh, things more available, uh, resources, brochures, uh, making things more translatable is absolutely something that we're working on. We put the translation extension on OTR's wiki that will help, like we do have a regular active um, uh, Chinese agents and, um, and making sure that, you know, one has a proficient English, a, a lot of the others don't, and making sure that it's, that the information, the help that we have available on the wiki is translated and provided so they know how to speak in Chinese with that photographer and share the, and share the, the, the guidelines that we have available for them. And this is all a very much a work in progress. One more quick question. Guys at the back, you might as well come down. How many, how many agents? How many agents? Uh, currently, we have around uh, 600 agents. 600? I just want to say for having been at the very beginning of OTRS that these are people that we don't think about, and they re we should really give them a big, big hand. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the... Um, guess what, eight years that, that uh, Wikimedia Foundation has been using OTRS, we've only opened 1,500, around 1,500 agent accounts. Um, we do have inactivity and we can close accounts um, and you, you can request to have it reopened and we'll do it. But we have about 600 accounts open at any given time working on, again, not only just the language cues, but there's, um, there's cues for chapters and they're involved. There's cues for Wikimedia Foundation. They use OTRS to a very limited extent for some of their cues just to simply help process some of the emails that they get. I think we better finish there. Thanks again, Keegan. Thank you. So now we're going to meet the press team. Nice to meet you, and thanks so much for being here today. Uh, this is the first time I'm meeting many of you. My name is Catherine Marr, and I've recently joined the foundation as Chief Communications Officer. And we're here as a team to talk a little bit today about the role of the communications team in the foundation and in support of the movement. Uh, we had a sort of 20-minute pre presentation prepared, but we thought this has been a really interesting week in the media, and there's probably a lot of questions and criticisms and media critiques we could hear from the audience, but also just a lot of questions you probably or may have. Uh, and so we'd like to sort of shorten our presentation to 10 minutes, talk all, very briefly about who we are, what we do, um, and then open it up for Q&A. So it's going to be a little bit more informal than we planned up until about 30 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> 
So I'll introduce myself first. I'm Catherine. As I said, I joined the foundation in April of this year. Um, I came to the movement not as an editor, uh, although obviously as a lover of Wikipedia and the projects themselves, and a very frequent user of all of those projects, perhaps an anonymous IP editor at times. Um, but before joining, what I did was I worked as a uh, the advocacy director for a digital rights organization, um, which focused on, as I said, rights on um, things like freedom of expression and privacy. We had a tech component to our organization that worked on open source solutions for privacy and freedom of expression, <laughs> like Tor, everyone loves Tor, how do we make sure that more people use Tor, things like that. Um, if anyone wants to have my GPG key, I'm happy to share it. I'm, you know, These are the sort of things that I'm really familiar with. Um, so it's a different sort of movement that I come from. Um, and I'm really excited to be learning about this movement and some of the things that we can do and some of the things that I've experienced from my background that I can hopefully bring. Um, but there's obviously a lot that I have to learn from all of you. Uh, so that's me. Um, and now I would love you guys to meet the rest of the team. Heather, do you want to maybe hmm. kick us off? How close do I have to be? Does this work? Hi, I'm Heather Walls, and <laughs> so um, one of the things that's really important to me in my work in the communications department is using design to help people engage with the movement, and by that I mean things like the tea house that was started two and a half years ago and is still going and is now actually run completely by volunteers and is used f to help people kind of soften their introduction to Wikipedia and get some help in learning how to edit and things like that. Um, also the blog, which Tillman is gonna tell you about. Um, I've also worked on, in grant making, making the process of applying for grants a little more obvious and maybe less scary, hopefully. S and other ways of letting people share the projects that they're starting and talking about them and getting more people to join the discussion. That's it. Oh. Howdy. <laughs> so uh, my name is Victor. I've been a volunteer Wikipedian since about 2005. I started the foundation around 2011. My role is to uh, pretty much put a human face on Wikipedia, tell the human side of how Wikipedia works. Uh, it's really easy for people to see black text on a white background and just think this thing comes out of the internet, but uh, the fact of it is that if, you know, lots of lots and lots of people are making it, and that's a story I think the world needs to know. Uh, for several years I worked in fundraising, and I recently moved to the communications team, which I think is a very, very natural shift. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. Um. So, my name is Tim Ambaya. I've been in the communications team since uh, 2011, I think. Um, I do various things. Um, we might go thought into it, but um, we thought we'd show you our new blog, which we launched that last um, week, and talk a bit about how this has been functioning as a as a platform really for the whole movement to tell their stories, to um, uh, share news or knowledge across the movement. Um, so you see the blog behind me in the new design. And that's actually a left, old and right new comparison. So you see uh, what's uh, kind of previously looked a bit like a media wiki wiki and we try and decide to change that. Um, we have like the opportunity now to feature posts that are especially important. We can, um, go to next. so yeah, that's the old design in, um, in large. And as you can see here, um, let's go down a bit. For example, we can uh, feature comments. We hope that people come to and comment a bit more on posts as they already do. And importantly, um, we really rely on volunteer contributions. So we, um, have changed to a mode from, I mean, it used to be the normal block of an organization where the staff of the foundation used to share their work. And when we tried to uh, decide to open it up a bit more, uh, like two or three years ago, um, so we actually have a page on Meta where you can go and draft your blog post that you want to share as a Mickey page. 
the other thing that is almost Wikimedia is actually easier to write something like that as a wiki page instead of in WordPress. It's a kind of a foreign medium for us. But you can go there, draft it, and we are copyrighted and edited on the wiki. We have a public calendar, by the way, where you can go. And you're also welcome to help copy edit, like any wiki page, right? And then we, the blog team at the foundation, uh, my colleague Carlos wasn't here, myself and Guillaume, um, put it over to the blog and publish it for you. So um, that's one thing we wanted to present here. And as we said, we have evolved this blog from a purely foundation-centric platform to um, something that's open for the entire movement. And the new design reflects that. Yeah, that's more to say about it. But uh, one other thing I want to mention briefly is um, that we're also responsible for the official social media channels, um, like the uh, Wikipedia account on Twitter. Facebook, yeah. Um, so, and what we do there is also we try to open it up to people who, I mean, we do this from the foundation, of course, we do blog posts, uh, but we also have a um, public drafting and reprocess, a, a social media mailing list where you're welcome to send stuff to there. If you want to retweet, have something you tweeted, or if you have um, some news that you want to share with us, which you think is suitable for that channel, you're welcome to contact us there and. Um, there's quite a few volunteers also who help out with um, reviewing stuff that goes out. So we have a, like a four eyes principle um, because we don't, uh, it's really easy to mess up on social media, right? Sometimes links are working or there's a typo or etc. And we have found it, it really helps us within the foundation or also for people who are outside the foundation who send us stuff to you um, to go through that process and then we post it. Yeah, so it's a Wikimedia Foundation Twitter account and Somewhere it's a Facebook page with a really beautiful uh, public domain image that Heather found recently. Um, yeah, I think we want to keep it short. Um, right. Um, I guess we're open for a discussion now. Catherine, you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Solomon, for that great summary. Uh, wow, we've already got questions. Yeah, let's just go right into a discussion. Well, you know, I'm not. Uh, no, I'm not going to say the word "monkey selfie," but uh, can you can you briefly tell us? I mean, you knew there was a press conference coming up. There was a big announcement. Uh, Jimmy Wales tweeted, "There's going to be a big announcement tomorrow." I mean, there was you know, pe there was people were excited about it. Yeah. Did you plan for the monkey selfie to head the news? And as as a press professional, could you? Uh, share your experience with that and <laughs> how, because also you made a correction statement on Twitter and in the press the day after and that would be really interesting. Um, I, I used the monkey selfie for years in my presentations to explain about free media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the monkey selfie was a learning opportunity for a lot of people I think. Um, I would love to say that we planned that and we're like these social media geniuses and we knew it was gonna go viral and we had like monkeys prepared in the basement for everyone to take selfies with. No, um, no. Uh, what's that? Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, the announcement, that was the announcement and actually this is the big news and I think that that's one of the things that unfortunately the press really sort of overlooked. Um, the big news was the transparency report. The big news is the way that the foundation legal team defends content and defends users and defends privacy. And the fact that we're so incredibly transparent about it, right? That we've collected all of this and we've provided not only a transparency report, but one of the most transparent transparency reports that anyone's ever seen, right? Like this is an awesome transparency report. I've read a lot of transparency reports and this is a really good one. Um, sometimes, a monkey gets in the way. And this is one of those instances. So yeah, there was a monkey. Uh, I think everyone's seen it by now. I don't know if we need to look at it again. Oh, we're gonna look at it again, okay. <laughs> it, it's a really cute monkey, right? Like, it's a sensational image. Um, the monkey, the, actually what ended up happening was The Telegraph, which is a publication based here in the UK, they ran a story that asserted the wrong explanation for why we had denied the request of the photographer. So if you read the explanation up there, it says we didn't agree and the image stayed up. 
I've talked a little bit uh, with the legal team and they're like, oh, we should have just left in the part about public domain. They were trying to whittle it down to like 89 words so that it was consistent with all the others and they took that explanation out. And had it been in there, this probably never would have been the story it was. The reason it became such a huge story was everyone was like, the Wikimedia Foundation thinks the monkey has copyright. <laughs> because that's the story that the Telegraph ran with. And once the Telegraph ran with that, everybody ran with that. And then the organizations that spent a little bit more time checking the law and asking us what the actual story was, then ran stories correcting the story. And so then that's what you, like, that's the sort of cauldron that then creates a 24-hour news cycle around the monkey. Um, the way that we responded to this was uh, to issue corrections, obviously. I think we sent out more than 40 corrections, probably more at this point, 50 corrections, something like that. We had a pretty boilerplate statement that we came up with legal that was like, just because the human doesn't own copyright doesn't mean the monkey does. Um, in fact, there are some things in the world that are just not owned, and it's okay that we can be okay with that. Some things belong to everyone. Um, and that's a hard concept for a lot of people, right? We've been conditioned to think that everything must be owned. And so there was sort of an education moment there. Um, and then of course what we tried to do is every time, and we did a lot of press, uh, was to talk about the transparency report, to be like, the reason this is an issue now, three years later, and far after this initial image made it into the media, is because we released our transparency report. And isn't that awesome, look how transparent we are. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess my personal feed yeah, my personal experience of this is I'm really glad that we have an awesome team, communications team, to support what was a really busy monkey day. Um, and that I will go down in history as the person who defended a monkey's right to not have rights. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. Do you want more monkey or is that good? Great, do monkey's you, out of the way. Do you think that has the story has um, an overall positive impact on Wikipedia? On, uh, yeah, it's, that's a really good question, right? Because as Keegan said, there have been messages into OTRS, and I've certainly gotten some really angry messages that I'm destroying the profession of photography. Um, and that stinks, because I love photography, and I think photography is an art, and uh, we happen to have an incredibly talented photographer sitting right next to me. Um, and I'd love to hear Victor's perspective on this vis-a-vis -vis photography in general. I think that we need to be really careful, right? So everyone wants to take pictures of themselves with a monkey and post it as a selfie. The foundation has a responsibility, I think, in, in my personal opinion, to be a little bit serious and respect the fact that this person, while the law may not be on his side, he's, he's aggrieved, right? And like, he can be upset about this. Now, he still has the right to sell the picture, um, to sell it, versions of it, that is. He can print out beautiful copies of it, right? He's got the original film. He can sign it, I mean, he can sign his name to it, whether that's like ethical or not. It, different question. He can do fundraisers around it, conservation efforts around it. It's just a public domain image. He doesn't own the rights to it. So I think that we need to be really sensitive to the fact that this is something that people are upset about. This is something, this is an individual who did invest a lot of himself in this trip. Um, and, and just, and as long as we are sensitive to that and we sort of stick to the, just the bare facts and we're not rubbing it in someone's face, then, then hopefully we can sort of navigate these shoals of this being actually something that, that people could be quite upset about. Well, uh, first off, I, th I guess I'd like to say I don't think I'm that great of a photographer. I think I'm an okay photographer. But uh, primarily, this is a legal issue. Uh, photographers are conditioned to think that everything that comes out of my camera is mine. And when you look up the law, the law says very clearly uh, that non-human animals cannot own copyright. Machines cannot own copyright. And uh, then I also want to say that two weeks before this whole thing happened, I published a documentary about last year's Wikimania. And Zico, your talk about the monkey, I put in it. Uh, and because it was so totally illustrative, and in your talk, you say that uh, there's this quote that everybody at, in the movement, in the uh, Wikimedia movement, uses that doesn't really explain things too well. It's free as in freedom, not free as in beer. That doesn't make any sense. And I thought it was a brilliant talk and pointing to this monkey as an example to explain copyright to people, I thought was a, a fantastic way to go. That's why I put it in the documentary. Uh, because, uh, you know, when you make a piece of media, you want it to be educational. You want people to learn something and take something from it. And I thought that was a great way to do it. So uh, I think 
per you know the question of what will people take from this I think overall people are going to learn a little bit more about copyright and in the world of the internet where people share stuff all the time I think that's really important and so we I think whether we like it or not we have an icon in the world for what copyright is uh, just one last thought as I as Victor was talking I think it also demonstrates for us the importance of being a movement that understands the role of the media because we found that the best stories the ones that really under that explained what was going on most clearly were the ones where we had engaged the most with reporters and like been on the phone with them and showed them the category of animal selfies and like talked to them because we have an awesome category of animal selfies I don't know if you guys are aware they're <laughs> lemurs and sheep and otter it's Elephants, fantastic. Um, so if you have more animal selfies lying around, upload them to Commons, obviously. Um, but you know, we found that talking to reporters meant that we got better stories that were not only, I don't want to say sympathetic, but that were explanatory and really sort of weighed, weighed the issues at stake and, and used it as a teaching moment, so. Yeah, well, it's, not, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, I think that something that's uh, visible in the in the monkey thing is that um, you know it's uh, specific to a few countries um, where you know it's the U.S. copyright law that says that uh, you have to be human to have copyright, and um, and I think that it's a it's a good example of how um, our what we do in the Wikimedia movement has a global impact and. Um, as soon as multiple languages get involved, it's very easy for the facts to get distorted over and over again. And um, I think that one one of the strong points of what we do, notably on the blog, is that we communicate in multiple languages. I don't think there are many uh, corporate blogs uh, where you have multiple languages. And so um, when, when Tillman invited people to, to contribute, I think it's important to say that uh, you can post in your own languages and not only in English. Uh, actually, the new blog in particular um, has a fantastic feature for, for highlighting that content too. Um, so we'd love to see more multilingual posts, in, including posts that are posted solely in that language. I'm curious, uh, how many people, uh, just as uh, we had like last year, we had 400 posts and about 100 of them had were multiple languages. And that was with the old blog. And with the new, we have much better features, um, like I said, to include translations. How many people in this room have written uh, up for the blog post? For the blog? So, so next year, let's double that. So just a, a quick note on the transparency report and the right to be forgotten. While a lot of the television and blogs and social media went full monkey, um, Wednesday going into Thursday, we had two stories in the New York Times, one on the transparency report, another on the right to be forgotten, neither of which mentioned monkeys. Washington Post was the same thing, Wall Street Journal was the same thing, Times of London was the same thing, uh, Telegraph did go full monkey right away, but I want to say that before the monkey took over, we got more ink on, a, on our transparency report and our right to be forgotten, probably than we've gotten since SOPA. So just a quick note on that. So this in the audience is Jove Oliver. Uh, Jove is the silent member of the team. Uh, he works uh, with the foundation um, as our, our PR and communications and media strategist, essentially. Um, so Jove. <laughs> And, and Joe was right. We had, uh, you know, the next day people were a little frustrated with the monkey monkey publication, and I had to sort of sit back and say, guys, we had a num remember how we felt last night when we went to bed? We felt like we'd won the internet on the right to be forgotten and transparency. So, okay. Any more questions? Hello, Sebastian Terburg, uh, Wikimedia in the Netherlands. Uh, video is also a, t a topic that has been discussed uh, during this conference. Uh, and one of the ideas came up to have the ability to share the raw footage with each other. What kind of materials would you like to see apart from blogs and photos of the chapters and what, con what kind of role could you play in, in uh, gathering and disseminating that material? Uh, could you rephrase the question? I, I, don't, quite, I don't quite understand. Well, um, when we reach the news, sometimes we get a lot of video too, or we make our own news by making our own videos. So what kind of other materials, apart from photos and text, would you like to show? And what role can you play in, in gathering all the raw footage 
and disseminating it to other chapters again so they can reuse that material to show uh, in their own countries. I'd love to do something like that. I just moved to the communications team and the idea, I, the idea of crowdsourcing video production is something I've been wanting to do for a very long time. Uh, it's a complicated process, uh, as you very well know. Uh, making uh, video, one of the kind of core values of uh, video is uh, continuity. Uh, making something look consistent throughout, not making it look jumpy. And doing something in a crowdsourced way uh, with text, it's a lot easier to correct it and smooth it out. With video, it's a lot harder. However, that said, uh, I'd love to figure out some kind of a system. The way that uh, video is with open source tools right now isn't as good as it could be. It's very difficult to do anything with WebM, uh, which is the best thing we have right now, but we do have all kinds of proprietary tools that we can use in that process. Uh, so if anybody's interested in helping me build something like this, uh, please get in touch with me. Yeah, I just to add to that, we have, an, we have a channel um, for video. We have multiple channels, channels for video. We have the social channel, which is obviously YouTube, but then of course we have Commons. Um, and I'd love to see us actually providing content, right? We, like, text is incredible. Uh, text actually, pres it, it reaches people in a different way than video does. Video is very emotive. I love watching Victor's videos for that reason, uh, they, in terms of the way that they tell stories. And so the more that we can be using video so that people can connect with the community on a sort of personal level, I think the better people will understand and, and see that it's a movement that they want to join or be a part of. So I, I would love to see more video. Um, the strategy for that, I think, remains, let's build it, right? Let's do that together. Um, recently, there was some really unfortunate um, media about the fact that like 90% of our medical articles contained errors. And we were kind of lucky in the sense that uh, we do have a really active medical, you know, project, on, you know. And we uh, also have some people who go out and speak quite often, and they already had data and statistics that we could get a head start on trying to go out and, you know, correct this in the media. And we also have some really awesome partner organizations we've worked with. But we still lost time, you know, getting out there because correcting something as soon as possible is really good. I mean, if you still, you know, Google this, I mean, you still find people are still coming out with this, saying this, which is not correct. So, I mean, I, you know, what suggestions do you have or can we maybe get toolkits put together to help people, you know, respond really quickly to this type of thing? So I want to say I think you're completely right. And I actually think that we made a mistake in not trying to find a way to address this faster. Um, I don't know that anybody expected it to be as big a story as it was, um, but I think that if I were to look back at the last few months, that's one of the things that I feel like we missed. And I think it's one of the things that I feel like I personally missed. Um, t toolkits and media trainings, I would love to do that sort of thing. We keep saying internally, like Q2, right? Like there's, there's just a lot to do. And I think that that's absolutely one of those things that should be on the priority um, list for us. One thing that I'd love is a list of, if you are an expert in some way, making yourselves available and letting us know right away when you see problems so that we can then go out and say to the media, look, this is a story, we have someone that you should talk to about this, right? Because I don't know everyone, there's hundreds of thousands of people literally in this movement. Um, and so the more that you present yourselves to us, the better we're gonna be able to make sure that your voice is out there speaking truth. Now, I wanna talk, have Tillman speak a little bit because I know he actually, really responded to this. Um, it's been a lot of thinking about it. Well, yeah, I mean, the thing is, um, the, uh, the study they're talking about, um, it didn't get that much media immediately, and um, this time I um, actually run this uh, monthly research newsletter with uh, Dario, they were talking about a bit yesterday at uh, the talk with Mika and Aaron. And uh, so we regularly review this kind of stuff, right, and I reached out to some people who are um, from the uh, Wiki Project Medicine, actually, who are talking about this, right? And this all clear, this is a really flawed study. And um, uh, so it's a little review that didn't uh, pan out in time. And um, later, I talked a bit with James Hillman, and he did, he with some others, got us something at the Cochrane blog, as you know, right? It was really good. It, yeah, it was too slow, right? We didn't, it was at the end of the media cycle. And also, it was kind of written for, I think, a bit more um, academic audience, right? It could have been. It was fine, it was fine, right? but we um, thought about 
Hab ich schon something about ourselves, we wish they might do where we make it a bit more punchy. Um, there's some really good talking points in this, right? I mean, the, the, the thing with the... Uh, one example was how many times, if you suspect you have hypertonia, high blood pressure, how many times do you have to repeat a measurement until you can be sure of the diagnosis. And Wikipedia said three times, and some other source said two times. And this guy, this professor, Vertiso, came out to uh, some media and said, this is Wikipedia's advice is wrong, it's endangering uh, people's uh, life or health, or whatever. It was cited to uh, uh, actually the uh, National Cardiology Association of the UK's recommendation three times, right? The media doesn't care about this, and this you really, really drafted point home, and we kind of failed on that, right? So, um, yeah, my advice is um, really if you have something like that, and I looked at the Wiki Product Medicine discussion, where people were really upset, and my advice really, really uh, write a blog post for us that we can also publish and post, like with our social media accounts, that's important too. So we retweeted the uh, Coffee and blog post and put it on Facebook, which got some attention, some good numbers, but yeah, it was pretty late. Okay, we've kind of got one minute left, so I don't know if you guys want to wrap up or we have one more question, really quick one. That went so fast, I'd love to. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Could you please introduce yourself? <laughs> uh, yeah, hi, I'm, I'm, it's not important who I am. I'm a, I'm a volunteer who works for this team. Uh, <laughs> so, um, no, I, I think the one, the one comment I, I wanted to make um, is really <clears throat> like one of the most um, important things that I need um, when I'm, I'm public facing and I'm talking to the media all the time. Um, and I love to hear um, great stories from the community, a story about something that happened, a funny story, an interesting story. And so I think um, one of the things that this blog can be great for, but also if it's maybe not appropriate for a blog, it's just a, a good story about how a conflict was re resolved. So it's nice if I'm, if I'm in, um, you know, uh, what, uh, where's Keegan, what about some of those controversies, uh, you know, um, Sea of Japan, right? If there's a good, fun story about how people met from different cultures and resolved a conflict, um, good, fun story about a young person who did something uh, like Jack and Drake or something like that, the more we can hear about those stories, the more we can tell those stories. And, you know, otherwise I'm, I'm left trying to make up my own stories and they're not very good. So, or I'm left telling the same old stories I've been telling for years. So, that's my only comment, really. Cool. So, well, thank you, I think, everyone for coming. I mean, no, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Not I think. I'm really, really happy you're all here. Um, <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I would second that. I'd second exactly what Jimmy says. More stories. The more people know about the, the personal experiences of everyone here, these incredible backgrounds that we all come from, the better off we're going to be and, and the more that we'll be able to share your stories. Oh, there, there you go. So thanks again to the comms team and thanks for all the questions as well. Thank you. Okay, so now we have um, a talk on the role of the Funds Dissemination Committee. Are you guys here? Yeah. Funds. Fun.
You're eating a snow crab. You gotta have a picture of that. Okay, everyone, um, we now have the Fun Distribution Committee, the Fun Dissemination Committee. Yes, um, so we have here some members of the Funds Dissemination Committee, uh, some of whom have been nominated and appointed recently. Um, so we're excited to welcome them all here and just give a brief talk uh, to introduce you to the work of the Funds Dissemination Committee, uh, how many in the audience are familiar with what the Funds Dissemination Committee is already? Okay, so most people. Awesome. Um, so I will go ahead and let the committee introduce themselves. I'm Winifred, by the way, in case you don't know me, and I support them as a Wikimedia Foundation staff person. Christian? Yeah. Uh, I'm Christian. From, I'm from Italy. I. I'm part of this committee since 2013, uh, when I was community elected with Delphine, and I've been involved with the Wikimedia chapter since 2007, and that's basically it. Um, I'm Cindy Poor, I'm username Flow Knight. I was on the advisory group that was debating whether or not this was a possibility that we could do this. So I feel like I kind of gave birth to this committee. And so then I went on the committee. So it's been a very exciting adventure for me for like um, since the inception of it. And Doris Jemelik from Warsaw, Poland. I'm on the committee for the last two years. And I would also like to take the pleasure to introduce my colleague, Natania uh, Stewart, a member of the committee who cannot use the microphone on Sabbath. And I'm uh, Anne Klin, user risker. I'm a new appointee to the committee. We just, Matanya and I just started off this last, this last few weeks. So uh. um, I'm Delphine Ménard, uh, and I've been doing various things in Wikimedia for the past many years. Um, and I am one of the elected members of the FTC uh, since, like, we've been a year in the FTC, so it's. Uh, we have a one-year experience about this. And we also have three other members of the FTC who aren't here right now, um, and that is Dumi and Ali and also Osmar. So they couldn't be here, but they're on the Funds Dissemination Committee too. Christian, did you want to uh, present from the microphone up here? Or? Yeah, yeah, right. uh, Okay, so I was volunteered for <laughs> this presentation, and <laughs> the first thing is the Fund Dissemination Committee, but sometimes it's also the Fund Dissemination Committee. So, uh, okay. So this is uh, the definition of the committee, and uh, we basically make recommendations to the Wikimedia Foundation boards of trustees about uh, Grant annual grant requests that come in that are coming from Wikimedia affiliates, and uh, basically, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, this is a really complicated chart 
to say that there is uh, the there are the strategic priorities of the movement and the uh, affiliates can can uh, propose uh, can write some proposal that uh, explain what they are going to do to support these strategic priorities and uh, out of this the FDC starts a review of uh, these proposals and um, which uh, are based on the impact that their activity, their proposed activities have on these strategic priorities and makes is a recommendation to the board. So, um, the, as I said before, the, the, the grants are annual plan grants, so uh, they, they are unrestricted funds. This means that, uh, in theory, the uh, applicants can uh, present us with a plan, but they still have the freedom to adapt and change over the course of the year if they see that, that there is the need to do that. And it's a general support. Uh, and this means that the uh, role of the FDC is not just lo not looking at the raw numbers, like why are you spending 10 instead of uh, 7 on this or that, but uh, it's like looking at the organization overall and their capacity to uh, do actual work and uh, even and know, and know, knowing that they are free to change their, their course if they see the need to do that. And this is a map uh, about uh, which entities uh, have been applying to FDC so far. Um, one thing that should be noted is that um, there are other um, ways to apply for a grant from the Wikimedia Foundation and uh, it doesn't, the, the FDC is one of them, it's suited for some organization, it's not, uh, it's not the right, it may not be the right process for all the organization. So the uh, Wikimedia Foundation staff has also this role of supporting the organization about choosing which is the best path for them to uh, receive some grants from the Wikimedia Foundation. And speaking about the staff, there also, there's also Katie there, which is uh, FTC staff, and uh, we are also receiving the support from Jesse from the uh, learning education program and uh, the support from Anasuya and Garfield. And well, the proposal process uh, has a few steps. The first one is a letter of intent, basically is a statement which is on Meta that says that uh, an affiliate wants to uh, apply for the FDC in the next round. Uh, the process is set up uh, such uh, as we have two rounds per year, one which is in November and one which is in May. And some month prior to, to these moments, the uh, affiliates who uh, want to participate in that uh, round, they have to sub sub submit this letter of intent with a ballpark amount of uh, the, that they are going to, to request and uh, there are some uh, eligibility <laughs> criteria uh, and then there is this, this process uh, which is again different from other has some deadlines one deadline is the, uh, the one for submitting proposals which is 1st of October for the November round and 1st of April for the May round if I'm correct Okay, uh, and uh, so there is a phase of community review. So the proposals are put up are put up on Meta, and the, all the community has the possibility to read them, to uh, comment on them, and the FDC members do also this uh, read this proposal and um, start asking questions to the to the uh, affiliates, and then. Uh, after this, there are other sources of input. One of them is the staff assessment, which is some um, analysis that are uh, done by the, the FDC staff uh, for all all the uh, proposal, proposals uh, received. And these are also published on Meta. Then we have the FDC deliberation, which uh, 
happen in face-to-face -face meetings and we have this uh, three to five days where we all are closed in an office and we cannot get out of <laughs> those rooms until uh, we don't have uh, finish our, our schedule <laughs> and and the goal of this is to review all the proposal make a deliberation about which um, uh, dollar amount to recommend, uh, to recommend to the board, which is one thing, but we also try to uh, explain why we are recommending this amount and we try to uh, explain this in uh, the recommendation test and, and we have also to draft this test, text, which is then put up on Meta and then uh, it's the turn off the board to uh, approve uh, this recommendation and give the actual grant. So far, the board has always approved uh, the FDC recommended amount and uh, narrative. Um, yeah, this is um, about some, some details about the decision making. We are doing this face-to-face uh, -face meetings because this allows us to be uh, focused and do the review of uh, really quite a large number of proposals in a quite uh, short time. Um, okay, and uh, this is okay. This is the, the decision making process uh, is facilitated by using a particular tool, which is this uh, gradients of agreement, which uh, I can explain more in detail later, maybe, or if there are questions. And this is the timeline. Uh, again. Um, the most important thing is that there are two rounds, and uh, uh, one is in November, the other, the, other, the other is in May, and there are prior steps to uh, actually be eligible to the FTC process. And oh. the, the important part is the important part is also the the, the reports. So while. The process where the FTC actually deliberates or, or assesses the, the proposal is one thing, but there's a year a long uh, process that helps us see how entities are uh, developing their program, what they're changing, what they might not be changing, and things like that. So this is that where you see the progress reports, Q3, whatever. Yeah, and for example, in one of the information we are getting from the staff assessment is uh, if uh, the entity has been producing the reports or uh, some salient information that are contained in those reports. So yeah, after the actual deliberation, the uh, entities receiving the funds uh, have to do the actual work and they uh, are requested to also report on that because this is used to uh, evaluate um, their uh, future applications. Uh, and I think that's pretty much it. Uh, so, questions. questions. This was meant to be a short presentation and to leave more time for questions. I'm sorry that you guys have ended up. A simple question, really. Um, I saw that all the grants were outside the United States. Um, is this because all the hostings there and, and basically some of the uh, organizations, uh, the central funds go to that and another amount is allocated to elsewhere in the world? Well, essentially the main reason for grants not being allocated to any American chapter is that we do not really have an American chapter. There is the American Wikimedia Foundation but the entities applying are basically chapters for all around the world. Does this address your question? The yeah. Th there's two, there are two American chapters, but they are smaller size chapters. Not, not right, and they're not eligible? Yeah, I, I, yeah. There are chapters that are not eligible for, for FDC funding. Yeah. Yeah. Again, basically this map is about only the FDC applying countries and so all the uh, countries that have received some FDC funds but uh, there if you uh, if you plot them up about all the countries where some grants have been have been granted this will cover much more of of the world this is just uh, specific to the FDC process right so um, like Wikimedia most um, 
wiki pages are .org. Does that mean they're hosted in the United States, and who's paying for that? So, mm. I'm not sure what what the question is. Um, okay, so. The, I don't know if you're familiar with the structure of the organization. Basically, there's the Wikimedia Foundation. The Wikimedia Foundation, which is based in the United States, hosts uh, the websites, and uh, that's where uh, Wikipedia is hosted. The Wikimedia Foundation uh, is also reviewed by the FTC. The FTC is a volunteer group that uh, uh, tries to kind of look at the, at the big picture. And, uh, uh, but that money is not shown here because there is, at least in the last runs, there was no dollar amount in, in which, which enters into our process, which is a tiny process of the whole Wikimedia funding or grants uh, uh, money thing, right? So we're just, just a tiny bit of that. Does that make sense? So, so where are your funds coming from? So, so where, where are your funds coming from? The, this is the Wikimedia Foundation fundraiser money, pretty much. So okay. from donors. Yeah. yeah. Can I can I just play it? Uh, okay. Basically. Uh, every, okay. Let's move. Right. Okay. <laughs> just one simple question. Can you give an example of, of of one instance where you said no, you won't get the money? It's because your application is bad or because we don't like what you want to do with the money. Well, there were non-eligible organizations, but I can give you a very good example. Uh, Wikimedia France at some point applied for money and they applied for a grant which we considered not necessarily suited for their needs at the time and we suggested that they shouldn't get the grant. They should get some bridge funding, but they, they didn't get the grant at all. And the story has a happy ending. Uh, in the last round, Wikimedia France applied as well. And they were the first organization in our uh, women's history which received absolutely full funding, exceeding the guardrails uh, which set by the, by the board, because they prepared an excellent proposal. So that is a story which, in which an organization wasn't ready, took time to reflect, prepared a perfect proposal, and got a full funding. Because uh, there were internal uh, problems, the way the organization was structured or being structured, didn't uh, feel that we didn't feel that it was uh, able to actually handle the money they were asking for. So at some point, this is also uh, why. Let's detach the thing from the money. I mean, we're really looking at capacity. We're looking at programs. We're looking at a whole range of things, and it ends up in a dollar amount. But it's really the things we're looking for. So uh, it's not about whether you're doing cheap or, or expensive programs. It's not just that. It's really about do you have the capacity to actually manage those those funds in a in a way that is going to bring our mission further. I have attended uh, yesterday's chairman's meeting and one of the talking points was uh, if the FTC could also be uh, kind of matchmakers because they should be able to say how uh, chapters can avoid issues with, uh, yeah, when, when having partnerships or so. We have been uh, included in this past year um, on site visits. Uh, the foundation goes and, and has been making site visits, and we as members have been going along on these so that we can go and have personal contact with them and have more in-depth discussions and along the lines. So it's not exactly what you're talking about, but we do think it's very important to give feedback and help people understand. And it's not a matter of just filling out the report, you know, uh, the proposal better. It's actually having... Um, developing the capacity and matching the capacity with what we believe will work for the, that organization in that area of the world. Let me add that we also volunteer for, for boards training. Uh, there has been two boards training so far, focusing on governance, structure, burnout, and we're, we're trying to do as much as possible to, to do the matchmaking. Uh, if I may, I remember there were cases, not too many, but some cases, prominent cases, everything is online on MetaWiki, where a request of a certain chapter basically didn't make any sense. Like they had some money, they were unable to spend it in that running year in a useful way, and for the next year they wanted ten times as much. And then I asked myself, is there no one who's talking to those people during the procedure and telling them to change that? And I inquired later, there were several sites, many people who did so, but they stubbornly went on. 
I had the impression I met those people later that they um, learned something and that something has changed in them. And in general, my impression is that we had some issues and this and they were complaining and so on. But my impression is there's a learning process and that things are getting better. Would you see that also? Um, on both sides, actually. On our side, I think we've learned a lot. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I do believe that uh, this hel us has also helped us refine the process and uh, get engaged uh, in a much more concrete way with, with applicants. Uh, the foundation staff team that supports us uh, has done a tremendous job at doing this. Um, we have also, as, as Sydney just pointed out, we do site visits, which means we try to go and see the grantees to have this connection. So there's definitely a learning curve. Um, and uh, hopefully, I mean, this is also the reason why we try to present it and talk to as many people here as possible to integrate uh, uh, different, the feedback or even just like the, the misconceptions about uh, what can uh, be working or not working or on the contrary. Good feedback is also nice to, uh, to get. But I think that um, the idea is really to try and, and grow uh, with the process. It was a process which just kind of said, okay, let's let's try this. And uh, uh, if you look, I think it's very interesting if you're, uh, if you look at the different rounds, there's three rounds now? Three? Four. Four rounds, yeah. So if you look at, at the, the difference uh, from round to round in uh, both applications and recommendations, I think you will see that uh, we have tried to to be as uh, um, on both sides as helpful and as as concrete and as uh, clear as possible as to how this works. I mean, there's still a bunch of things to do and lots to do, especially in metrics, which is like the big overarching uh, thing Wikimedia will do in the next uh, few months and years. Uh, but I think we are on a, on the right track. So yeah, I I hope I I want to hope that there is a learning curve on both sides. Also, I want to say that there was an advisory group that was set up at the beginning of the process, and they um, met, were scheduled to meet two years after the process started, or, to, or I guess four rounds, two complete years, to assess whether it was working or not. And they did meet and have given some recommendations to the board, and the board is, you know, deciding exactly if what tweaks need to be happened, but we are progressing under the assumption that we aren't going away, you know, but we are. Um, open to modifying to make the process better for everyone involved as, as we need to. Thanks. Okay, so we have just a few minutes left. So I think we have one question here and then possibly one more. Okay, uh, thank you. I have actually two questions. Uh, first is uh, I noticed a lot of those uh, funding numbers are uh, granted to one specific chapters only. What's the current uh, policy on uh, if there are grants requesting from, uh, you know, Cooperations between two or more chapters. Uh, secondly, I know that the uh, funds the Semantic Point Committee is uh, very stringent on the al allowing chapters to have employees, and I just wonder uh, what is the current again policy on it, and is it possible to have you know, uh, po an employee shared by several chapters, something like that? Thank you. I'll try to be short. So far, there has never been a case in which two chapters applied for money. I think it would be a very interesting case and it would be a very good idea to have cross-chapter collaboration. Uh, employees can be funded uh, through the FDC uh, scheme. Again, it would be really good if the resources of the movement, including uh, human resources, could be shared. Uh, we would be open to you know working with people like you know we tried to do that. I mean, in earlier rounds, we tried to be creative in helping organizations do what seemed to work for them at that moment in history in their organization. I think maybe one final question. Uh, hello, um, I'm from the Tanzania Development Trust and we're re really interested in trying to set up a chapter in Tanzania and I wondered if there was funding available for that sort of thing. Can you, sorry, I, I didn't get that. For setting up a chapter? But it, what, what was the question? This is not the, this is not this this stage. Uh, there is uh, affiliations committee which deals with all those cases for setting up a chapter. Uh, to be eligible eligible for the FDC funding, uh, a chapter has to go through certain conditions, and establishing a chapter is not the the FDC funding scheme. And there's also other places you can go to get grants. You know, the, the, you know uh, that would assist somebody in setting up a chapter. It's a separate uh, process that you could go to. Um, but there is funds for there are funds for that sort of thing, but it's just not this committee. Okay, so just so that you understand the process, if you ever get to the FDC part, 
you will have to have uh, some kind of organization that has a history of uh, managing grants um, and when you have that then as an as a, as a and, and you have to become an affiliate and when you're an affiliate then you can and have this past history with grants then you can apply to the FTC. Thanks. Okay, any final words from the committee? We're out of time, so no. Okay. Really quick. Yeah, it's two words. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get it. Grants booth. There's a booth down upstairs over down under. Come visit us. <laughs> Okay, thanks to the committee and thanks to all the uh, participation too.